All right, welcome back to Bayou Time. I'm Martin Falls. Last week, Terrebonne Parish continued its Terrebonne 200 sessions at the Barry Bonvalin Home of Terrebonne Civic Center. The topic last week was about education and how education evolved in the parish over the last 200 years. Five speakers gave presentations about different aspects of education. First of all, welcome everybody to our fifth installment of the 200th anniversary of Terrebonne Parish celebration, Evolution of Education in Terrebonne Parish. I'd like to start by um, asking uh, our uh, councilman, Mr. Carl Harding, could you lead us in a prayer, please? Followed by a pledge from our parish manager, Mr. Mike Toops. Heavenly Father, it is truly a blessing for each and every one of these human beings uh, that we are here, that's found uh, on the land of the living. We ask, O oh God, that you look at our hearts and our minds, O oh God, and our desires, O oh God. And then as we believe and we go forth and give an acknowledgement of two things, O oh God. One thing, O oh God, that there is a God and we are not you. We ask, O oh God, that you take this program and, and the intention of the program that the blessings can be bestowed for more progress uh, for Turbone Parish. Not just Turbone Parish, but to exalt us into world affairs that we can grow citizens that would be respectful and give back to our community. We ask the blessings upon Turbone Parish forever, O oh God, in your darling son Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, welcome. My name is Darren Guidry. I'm chairman of the Terrebonne Parish Council, and i um, glad that you all are joining us here today. I'd like to announce a few dignitaries. Uh, we have our director of the Terrebonne Levy and Conservation District and former Senator Mr. Reggie Dupre here. Reggie's in the back. Uh, we also have former Judge Fungi, Jude Fungi is here. Judge Fungi, welcome. Uh, we also have former parish president, current director of the Council on Aging, Mr. Michelle Claude. Uh, we have the former superintendent of education, Mr. Philip Martin, who's here. And we also have Christian Bajeron, who's here with Garrett Graves' office representing Cong the congressman. Uh, welcome, Christian. Thank you for coming. We also have several distinguished school board members that will be introduced and will be guest speakers here today. You know, education has changed a lot in the years since my grandfather went to school and, um, you know, a attended nine years because that's how many there was. And if he spoke French, he got his hand slapped. Um, things have changed a lot since then. And uh, it'd be it's going to be uh, very interesting to hear the whole story of the evolution of education, at least in Terrebonne Parish. And to do that, I'd like to uh, introduce the school board member and the person who uh, helped put this together, and that is Ms. Debbie Benoit. Ms. Debbie, go ahead. The program is yours. Again, thank you all for being here, and we appreciate your attendance. Um, I'd like to also introduce to you our, uh, the co-chair for this uh, meeting, and that is uh, Ms. Stacy Soleil, who represents District 5. She also serves on the school board with me. And is Ryan Dettelier here? Okay, Ryan was also um, a committee member that did a lot to help us uh, organize this event, and uh, he is with Fletcher. Um, there's some other committee members that are panelists, and they'll be introduced individually as right before they present. <clears throat> So, as early as 1858, a non-sectarian school, the Homa Academy, began our story of education in Terrebonne Parish. Twelve years later, in 1870, parochial education began through the Catholic Maronite Order. And then 41 years later, the Episcopalians, the Baptists, and the Methodists established miss mission schools. According to the Sanborn maps, public school, though, officially began behind the Homa Courthouse in 1885. And then in 1890, Terrebonne Parish School Board was founded by the police jury. 
Back in those days, small groups of students worked with teachers in one-room schoolhouses. Often, they missed school for periods of time because they tended to crops, assisted with hunting and trapping for their families, or didn't even go to school at all. Fast forward today, Terrebonne Parish Public Schools in size is number 14th in the state of 70 districts. We are a B school district serving approximately 15,000 students and employing 2,300 teachers, administrators, and staff. In fact, we are the largest employer in Terrebonne Parish. Additionally, there are nine non-public or private, uh, I would say private or parochial school systems in our parish today, serving thousands of students and employing hundreds of employees. This evening, we had provided for your enjoyment education memorabilia. I think some of you have looked at it already in the back, and we invite you to do so after the program if you haven't so far. We also um, have provided you with a homework book. <laughs> It's on the seats. Uh, you will grab, grab one if it's not one near your seat or on your seat. Um, and in those are the timeline for the evolution of education. You'll see the dates from the very beginning to today, what has transpired with education. Also, uh, compliments of Dr. Sinak, uh, we have a narrative of the highlights of education also included in that. And, um, and also the brochure for tonight that you'll be able to see the agenda. In your leisure, we invite you to, um, to uh, go to the Terrebonne200.org um, website where we have posted information of the first 150 years of education as covered by the Homer Courier back in 1972 on the 150th year celebration. Tonight, our distinguished panelists will fill the gaps by focusing primarily on the last 50 years. The format, the format tonight is going to go as follows. We have five topics to cover. Each speaker will have approximately 15 minutes. Then the next speaker will be introduced. We ask that you hold your questions until all the speakers have presented, and upon which then we'll have Q&A. So let's begin. For 48 years, Philip Martin has served as an educator, all in Terrebonne Parish. He's held every position from classroom teacher all the way to superintendent and everything in between. He's a graduate of Terrebonne High and holds a master's plus 30 degree from Nichols State University. He is recently retired, as you probably know, and he's enjoying spending his time now with his two children, his six grandchildren, and his recently born new great-grandchild. So, Philip, have the mic. Thank you, Ms. Benoit. I think I was asked to uh, be a part of this tonight because people probably thought I'd been here for 200 years, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I have been here for the last 48 of the 50 uh, as a part, an educator in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, when you try to capture the history of anything, some, you don't want to leave things out. But in 15 minutes, you can't include everything. So I will try to hit upon what I consider and what some of us consider to be some of the high points. The early 70s, integration was fully, finally in, in, in implemented. Uh, obviously, that was a major change. Uh, it's hard to imagine at one time it was not. But certainly that did take place, which I think is a very significant uh, issue. In the uh, early 70s, there were two high schools. There was Terrebonne and South Terrebonne. By the way, Terrebonne was started in 1909. It's been in this current building since 1940. Uh, it was the oldest accredited high school in the state of Louisiana. So there's some very significant history. And, and, and you can probably tell that I'm alumni from Terrebonne High, so I'm probably a little a little biased with that. Uh, late 70s, H.L. Bourgeois opened, which was the third high school, and then the late 80s, Ellender High School opened, 
So there are four high schools. There are four relatively large high schools when you look across the state at high schools. There are two 5A high schools, which is the largest classification, which is uh, Terrebonne and H.L. Bourgeois, and two 4A high schools, which is South Terrebonne and Ellender. The things that have changed dramatically in my mind is that uh, our, our, our parish has changed in many ways. Our parish, well, I've seen over the 48, our bayou communities shrinking in size and shrinking numbers of kids. Uh, that's been reflected in that we've, we've had several schools that we did not want to, but you, you, for, to have a school, you have to have two things, teachers and kids. We had the teachers, but didn't have the kids. Uh, to give you an example, that's Little Caillou, Dularge Elementary, Ponishan, I'm sure Greenwood Middle, Dularge Elementary, and I'm sure I've left some out, but you get a flavor that we've been, we've been downsizing as, and I think our Bayou communities, it's a result of not one single thing. I think it's, when I first started 48 years ago and I started in a Bayou community, the vast majority of my kids the vast majority, their parents were involved in either commercial fishing or the oil field. Well, we kind of know what's happened to both of those. And along the way, let's throw in numerous hurricanes that people have, been, have endured. So I think all of those things contributed to a shrinking of the, of the bayou communities. Um, the last 50 years have seen a lot of things change in education, probably the most significant is that we all, all school districts in Louisiana get graded and get a letter grade. As Ms. Benoit pointed out, we're a B school district. We were an A, but they changed the grading scale and it slid us back down to a B. But of the 17, excuse me, of the 72 school districts, we rank 14th, which I wish it was higher than that, but it's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. If you were number 15, you wish you were number 14. Uh, that brought about a, a, a tremendous change in, um, in schools, in terms of anxiety, in terms of teacher stress, because who wants to be an F? But, and teachers get graded on how well their kids do on the state test. That was something very much unheard of before this last 50 years. That was teachers taught what, pretty much taught what they felt like they wanted to teach and how they wanted to teach and, and, and the methods they wanted to use. Uh, I guess you could call that the good old days. Now it's no, the kids must know this. And this is what you must teach. And by the way, we're going to know how, how your kids did on that and it's going to be reflected upon you. That's stressful to teachers and stressful to superintendents because we also get graded. And like I said, we, we did not want to be an F or a D school district. I don't think anybody's totally satisfied with being 14 out of 72, but uh, it, it's certainly some advantage to not being seven, number 72. Uh, during that time, during this time, some of the most significant things, you know, the, uh, we've built some brand new schools in the last 50 years, uh, Grand Cayo Elementary, uh, Grand Cayo Middle, excuse me, uh, brand new school, uh, South Down Elementary, brand new school, and something a little, uh, I think, perhaps ironic, as I was speaking with someone before the, uh, before the meeting, that we mentioned that Montague Elementary, which is our oldest school, it's 120 years old, literally. For the hurricane, it suffered very little damage. As did South Down, as did Grand Cayo Middle. If they had electricity, they could have opened the next day, literally. Uh, all our schools were not that fortunate, as you probably, as you probably know. Um, some first that happened in Terrebonne Parish, Miss Benoit was the first lady board president. Uh, Mr. James Charles, a dear friend of mine, was the first African-American superintendent. Ms. Liz Skirto was the first lady to be superintendent. Uh, Mr. Leroy Lyons was the first African-American male to be superintendent, excuse me, board president. 
Uh, so those are some very significant first and perhaps things that would not have been heard of preceding the last 50 years would probably just never would have never happened. So there are a lot of good things that have happened, and and we're certainly uh, proud of those things. I think they're all positive and, and moving in the right direction. Some things that perhaps are a little more disturbing is that when I was a first brand new young administrator and I was going to set the world on fire and make every teacher a wonderful teacher and every student a scholar, I did not want police on my campus. I felt it sent the wrong message. I've got control of this. I don't want to, I don't want it to appear that I do not. I'm in charge. Well, just as it may not have been possible to have women and minorities in certain positions, things have changed. I have also changed on that position in light of the last 20 years of all the horrible things that are happening on school campuses uh, around our country and around the world. We have police on our campuses now on a daily basis, and they're welcome. Uh, I have, I have uh, reformed or, or thought differently in terms of, of, of a police presence on school campus. It's not so much to control the kids that are there, because we always have a pretty, pretty good handle on that. It's for the people out there who want to do things to, for whatever reasons they want to do it. Uh, so the advent of SROs is certainly a, uh, a relatively new and happened within the last 50 years. Uh, it, it's, it's probably not something we, we're happy about. We're happy to have the SROs, but we're not happy with the reason why we need to have SROs. I think everyone would agree on that. Uh, you know, at once upon a time, we used to, uh, what's changed in education over the last 50 years is kids that perhaps may be struggling or not succeeding in school or not coming to school or misbehaving in school, we, we were very happy to say just stay home. We're very happy with that. That has changed. That's changed from a legal perspective. That's changed from an educational perspective. The school system now embraces every student every day. We had one of our four high schools cumulative. There's a 96% graduation rate. From the kids who entered in ninth grade and they graduate, how many graduate? Four years later. That's the highest in the state, by the way. That, that is a remarkable accomplishment in the last 50 years, when at one time it was around 60%. Uh, now, there are many factors for that, but the biggest factor is that we no longer, there are no throwaway kids, there are no give up on kids, there are no kids that no matter how problem, problematic they may be, and children can be very problematic, as you can well imagine, uh, we go get them and bring them to school, and we, we make them graduate. We don't give them an option. And that, that's something I think Terrell and Parrish should be very proud of, of is a very high graduation rate. Uh, it doesn't happen easily. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts to that. And, and, and many children are coming from situations that I won't get into all of them, but you would just say, oh my God, if you, if you understood some of the things that children have to deal with. And it may explain sometimes why they uh, may be problematic. Uh, School uniforms, you, you know, some people like them, some people don't. Uh, but we've had them now for uh, Dr. Fidesco, it's probably 20 years ago. Uh, we've had school uniforms, which is a, which is a big change. Uh, I, I think, I sense from, from, from what I'm, the parents I speak to, they like the school uniforms. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a debate, a fight about what are you gonna wear and what are you gonna buy for school. It's pretty much, pretty much spelled out for you. Uh, I, I don't think there's any magic to a school uniform. I really don't. But I do think it eliminates a lot of distractions or potential distractions uh, a school uniform. So that's something that's been done here, like I said, in the last 50 years. Another gigantic quantum leap forward is technology. 
You would not believe at the age kids become what I consider very literate in technology. Vastly exceeding my uh, capabilities. I will share a story with you, and I won't sell any names, but it'll give you a highlight. I received a phone call one day, and he said, hi, this is so-and-so. I'm with the FBI. Well, I immediately like, okay. What are you calling for? <laughs> I was very relieved it had nothing to do with me, by the way. But there had been a national security breach through some computer system, and I won't name the governmental agency, that originated with one of our eighth grade students. The kid was the kid was a very very good child, but liked exploring and liked experimenting and liked pushing the envelope. Well, he pushed it so far. He had the FBI down and had to. Make, and once they figured out the kid is not with the KGB, he, he's he's not with he's not with China. He's not connecting anything. He's just he's just a 13 year old who's very literate in computer stuff and 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 we concluded we did not do any disciplinary action to the child by the way uh, but I do remember that the last conference we had with the parents and the FBI they said young man when you finish high school call us we have a job for you <laughs> he said we thought this was impenetrable and we have a 13 year old who got in uh, so technology is a is a is a game changer, and, and again, this is something that we needed to do and should have done, and, and that began on Dr. Fidesco 20 years ago. We first began that, that journey with technology, uh, and it's, it's, and it's it, by the way, technology, you never get to the end of that journey, because right when you master one thing, it's gone, and another thing is coming in. So it's, it's a non-ending journey, and fortunately, our, our teachers have embraced it, and used it in the classroom. If, you, if you've not been in a classroom and saw technology at work, you know, we don't have chalk anymore. I don't think we even buy it. Uh, it's all technology. It's all on smart screens. It's all on, and I forgot the name of the boards, but there's a name for them. And, and, and it, they're interactive with the teachers and kids. It's amazing that the, uh, the learning that can take place. Uh, technology will never replace one thing. The teacher, ever. We've tried virtual, that's something else that was very part of the last 50 years. Keep the kids home, click on a, click on a computer screen, and think that the kids are gonna to stick to that for 360 minutes a day with focus and determination. It does, doesn't work. Anyway, I was very, very pleased to be here tonight. I, I hope I've shared with you some insights over the last 50 years that have been significant. There are many, many more things that have happened in education, but I tried to hit upon the few that probably were the most significant. I think it's now, I'll turn it over to, okay, very good. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. David Boudreaux, who has served in the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau as an educator for 37 years and Terrebonne Parish School System for five years. He has taught music, religion, video journalism, and 30 of his years in education were spent as an administrator. He was an assistant principal and president of Vanderbilt Catholic and principal and then president of E.D. White Catholic in Thibodeau. David and his wife Mary retired in 2020. Together they have 79 years of educational experience. One of his many hobbies is history, so he was glad to agree to be a member of this committee. And we really appreciate having him. He's been tremendous. So, Mr. Boudreaux, I'll turn it over to you. Check. Check, okay. I'd like to move around a little bit, so I'm going to move out here. First of all, I want to thank Debbie and Stacy for uh, inviting me to be part of this committee because uh, I'll tell you, I learned a lot of pretty cool things, and I'm going to share some of those with you this evening. Um, 
What I've chose to do, because when, when I looked at the scope of non-public schools in Terrebonne Parish, I did not realize it encompassed so many schools. Every school before the first public school, of course, was a non-public school. And so when I started doing a little research, I found that there were schools everywhere. Almost every plantation had a school. Almost every bayou area had a school. Most of them were one-room schools like these that I, that I have up here. Many of these schools, like I said, were sponsored by plantations uh, or by churches. And uh, as Debbie mentioned, there are a number of uh, mission churches, uh, especially in the, in the bayou areas that, that all denominations sponsored. What I chose to do so that um, my talk uh, falls within the 10 or 15 minute range is focus on the history of the current non-public schools in Terrebonne Parish. And so that's what, that's what I'm going to do now. Um, my history actually starts right here. Okay, if you drive down Homa today, uh, this is Point Street, and that's Barrow Street there. And I didn't actually know this, uh, that on this site was built what eventually became, it, it, at the time, it was a state of art school. Okay, this was originally Homa Academy. In 1858, six gentlemen, four of which were either previous mayors of Homa or soon to be mayors of Homa out of the six, they were businessmen. And in the research I'd done, they were listed as Anglo Anglo-Saxon gentlemen. They were not of French descent, okay? And they wanted a state-of-the-art school in Homa. Okay, so they incorporated uh, Homa Academy in uh, 1858. And they, they built this, uh, as you can tell, from the size of the school compared to those one-room schoolhouses, this was unbelievable, okay, uh, in Homa. And this is what I didn't know. Uh, that school was actually designed uh, by Henry Howard, who was the same person who designed Maidwood Plantation. He designed the Pentalba Apartments bordering Jackson Square, as well as Nottaway Plantation. So these gentlemen took significant funds and built this school, even though the entire, the entire population of Homa at the time was below 500 people. So they put all this money out, they built this beautiful school, the Civil War happens. We have a lot of economic issues uh, in Terrebonne Parish, well, through, throughout the South. And then the police jury in Terrebonne Parish opened a free public school not far from Saint, where St. Francis Church is today. So because of the economic challenges and the fact that there was a pretty darn good public school, the school went bankrupt. Okay, by 1868, they put the school up for sale. Okay, there was a debt of about $3,500 on the school. Seems little today back then. That was a heck of a lot of money. So anyway, these guys wanted to unload the school. So who bought it? A bunch of sisters bought it, okay? The school was purchased by the Maronites of Holy Cross. And uh, this is actually standing on Point Street, not far from Gabas, I believe. And uh, I took Judge Randy Bethencourt, actually attended this school. So he and I went out there for about an hour to figure out where was this thing actually located and... That culvert right there gave it away. I found some pictures of the school with the exact same culvert, and this is exactly where that school was located. Okay, the culverts lined up. And so uh, basically what happened in, uh, in 1870, the Mary Knights of Holy Cross opened up their school. It was originally named Our Lady of the Sacred Heart Academy. It consisted of 28 students, all girls, and all uh, in elementary age. Uh, fast forward uh, till, let's see, until uh, 1879, they had their first graduate. Her name was Rosa Cuneo, and they changed the name of the school to St. Francis de Sales Academy. Okay, and the sisters, the Mary Knights of Holy Cross, uh, ran that school. Um, 
I could just imagine teaching in the South with no air conditioning wearing that. I just always thought that was fascinating, okay? But the Mary Knights of the Holy Cross uh, taught that school. Uh, in, 18, in 1918, uh, they actually moved the, the younger boys and the older boys to the old building near the church. So the sisters maintained a school for girls at the uh, St. Francis Academy, and the boys attended uh, this old school. A great transformation happened in 1952. The current St. Francis Elementary was built, and the, the girls the Marionites of Holy Cross, and the younger boys were all moved into this school, while the other school, the old St. Francis Academy, was staffed for the first time by the Brothers of the Sacred Heart. So the, uh, and these are the uh, origin, original brothers, Brother Warren, Casimir, Brother Osmond, Brother Carl. I uh, saw Brother Carl just last Sunday. He's still alive. He's living in Baton Rouge, and uh, he was one of the first Brothers of the Sacred Heart in Terreborn Parish. So the brothers ran the boys' school, the sisters ran the girls' school. Another interesting thing that happened in the early 50s was that uh, Buddy Morcello was hired to run the uh, athletic program because prior to that, uh, if young men wanted to play football, they actually went to Thibodeau and boarded at Thibodeau College because the brothers were in Thibodeau and they believed in a full uh, athletic program. So young men in the Homa would board in Thibodeau. So when Buddy Marcella was hired, that turned things around in Homa. The uh, enrollment of the boys' school skyrocketed, not to mention a few state championships in baseball and football. And then in uh, 1965, uh, the boys were moved from St. Francis Academy into Homa Central Catholic. The girls, the high school girls, uh, left what is now St. Francis and 1965-1966 school year was the first year of Homer Central Catholic High School. Uh, and that's a picture of uh, eventually it became Vanderbilt. But the interesting thing was it was not only co-educational, it was co-institutional. And if you walk into Vanderbilt Catholic today, all of the ladies' restrooms are on the left of the school, all of the young men's restrooms on the right of the school because when you went to school there for at least the first three years of his existence, there was a girl side, there was a boy side, a brother was the principal of the boy side, a Maronite of the Holy Cross was the principal of the girl side, and the only place you could meet was the cafeteria or the library, which was in the middle of the school. So after a number of years, um, they decided to uh, consolidate it. On uh, March 27, 1966, the school was dedicated to the name of Father August Vanderbilt. He was the pastor of St. Francis for many, many, many years, and he was an ordinary supporter of Catholic education. He also was the person responsible for building the current uh, St. Francis Cathedral. So what happened after a few years uh, the brother was made the principal, and the sister was made the assistant principal, and I don't think they've gotten over that to this day, okay? <laughs> because they actually started the schools around here, but the man actually got top billing, so uh, it's still kind of touchy. So, so anyway, that's what happened at Vanderbilt Catholic. St. Bernadette in 1961 opened uh, with grades one through four, it was a big time of expansion for Catholic schools in the area. 62 to 67, the grades expanded to K to 7. St. Gregory opened in 1964. Same kind of idea. This is with the Sisters of Notre Dame. The Dominican Sisters were responsible for St. Bernadette for many years. And then St. Gregory added grades up until they were K to 7 in 1967. Uh, these are other Catholic schools in the area that existed at one time. St. Lucy had a school uh, that was elementary high school for African-American students. St. Joseph in Chauvin was a K-12 school uh, that actually closed, if I rem remember correctly, in uh, 1972, there about that. Holy Rosary had an elementary school. Annunciata had an elementary school and Maria Immaculata had, a, uh, had an elementary school. I guess the biggest change in uh, education in the, uh, in the Catholic school system 
is that it, it, you noticed uh, we had the Brothers of the Sacred Heart. We had the uh, Marianites. We had the Dominicans. Okay, uh, we had the Sisters of Notre Dame. There are no longer any religious working in the Catholic school system. But they have attempted to, uh, knowing that their orders were dwindling in number, they attempted to pass on what's called their charism, okay, their philosophy, their religious philosophy, to those people who now work in those schools. So I guess that's the, the biggest difference, okay, in the Catholic school system at least. And, and because of that too, uh, it had an implication on tuition because basically the sisters and brothers work for virtually nothing. They took a vow of poverty. So uh, they had to charge higher tuitions as there were fewer and fewer religious uh, in the area. St. Matthew's in 1947, St. Matthew's decided to open up a, a kindergarten. And then starting in 1970, they actually expanded until they reached what they have today, uh, a school that encompasses uh, kindergarten to seventh. Homer Christian opened in uh, 1984. Okay, it was founded by uh, their pastor, Rene Monet, by the Living Word Church. Uh, it now houses pre-K to 12 and currently has about 670 students. Uh, our Montessori school was founded uh, by Dr. Jules uh, Bouquet and it opened in 2002. It's still in the same location and it provides a hands-on learning experience. Then we had in uh, 2007, we had Covenant Christian was founded by the First Baptist Church. And it began as a K-8 to school, but uh, to do with only 78 students. Today, it's K-12, to and it has hundreds of students in attendance. Uh, the last uh, non-public school to open was e-learning. It opened in 2007, and it was opened uh, by the owners, Doug and Nancy Toops. And uh, basically, it's uh, right across the street, okay, that way. And I guess this is probably the most important slide because I showed you a lot of pictures of buildings, but we all know education really doesn't have anything to build, do about buildings. It's about students and teachers and parents working together. And I think what I did learn, especially looking at some of the older pictures, is that for 200 years, education has been extremely important to the people in Terrebonne Parish. Whether it was a one-room school or whether it's a state-of-the-art school that exists now, it was clear that the parents in Terrebonne Parish wanted to educate their children so they would have a better life than they did one day. And I think that dedication still exists today, whether it's a private school or whether it's a public school is uh, quite frankly irrelevant. And building on that 200 year tradition, I guess it's fitting that we do this tonight because I, on Monday, uh, there are classrooms throughout our parish, whether they're private schools or public schools, where the same thing is going to be going on that went on for 200 years. You're going to have great teachers with students working with parents to give those young people a better life than their parents had. So uh, I guess I guess it's a little saltless knowing that the, uh, I guess the people that are going to give the 50th, uh, I mean the 250th anniversary speech, I guess they're in one of those classes right now. <laughs> and, one, and one day they will be the leaders of our parish. And I, I think, look, judging from the last 200 years, I think we'll be in pretty good hands. All right, thank you so much. All right, our next presenter is Mr. Carl Carly Harding. He has also been one of our committee members, and he's a lifelong resident of Terrebonne Parish. He graduated in 1973 from Terrebonne High and attended Grambling and Nichols State University. He currently serves as a council member for District 2 and is a member of the beautiful uh, Zion Baptist Church, where he serves as senior deacon, teacher, and board of trustee chairman. Mr. Harding completed associate courses through the LSU Fireman Training Program as well. And I give you Mr. Harding, who will also talk to you about black education in Terrebonne Parish. Good evening. I think it's rather fitting that um, I'm here to follow such great men as 
uh, Mr. Morton and Udo, um, because they uh, taught me some things. And actually, I don't feel so bad that I'm here because they've gone and give basically more information than I can actually conjure up at this moment. But then I'm going to make my presentation. And I was contacted um, a few weeks, about a week or so ago. And asked to sub for someone. And I looked at this opportunity to look at God and his directions that he had given me. And to look at an opportunity to speak and only my steps are ordered by him. So I stand before you, and I'm so happy that Mr. Rogers is in here. It was my literature teacher, and Mr. Brown said he, had, uh, he was his too. Uh, um, I'm going to read this because the, the length of time. I'm going to try my intellect by sounding intelligent and not relying on my limited ability to secure knowledge, but rather my skills. Sternberg's theory identifies three types of intelligence. One, being practical. The other, being creative. And the third, analytical. So therefore, I will hope that you accept my practicality my creativity, and I would hope that each and every one of you here be very, very analytical. I am diverse. I am talented. I am a product of my environment, and I promise you, I wouldn't change that for the world. I plan and had planned to be brief, not knowing how much time that I have. But in being brief, I can't be so direct. Because some of you in this room, and some that may be about by social media and whatever's written that comes out of my mouth may not be able to accept, as of this moment, even though we're celebrating 200 years of Terrebonne Parish existence, with this particular segment of the celebration referencing into education. I feel pretty good that Mr. Rudro went back several years, not as long as Mr. Martin did. So I kind of based everything on the short meeting that I had on the information here. But then I have to use my skills and perhaps seem to be intelligent using particular theories, but relying on you, on your acceptance, not to hate the message. Not to hate the messenger, but hate the message, if you will. But I hope that you choose not to do either. Just accept the message as it is, whether you're going to be creative in your own minds, you're going to be practical in your own mind, or you're going to be analytical in your mind. Because even though the presentation, as if I would have had to read it, it wouldn't last no more than three minutes. But I'm only using my skills 
and my ability to do like Mr. Boudreaux and walk away from the mic a little bit. But we look at realistically, and I'm going to go about my business, and that was a little bit of sarcasm within my own humor of myself that, you know, I mean, I am here and I'm rather nervous, and guess what? I want to present this particular case and the situation and the scenario that I'm in right now to you. As I see out there, I'm not blind. I am not blind. That's being practical. I'm not being analytical, but I'm being practical. And most often times we talk about education, and like was said with Mr. Martin, and as was relayed by Mr. Boudreaux, you have to understand in 2022, statues don't kill no more. Schools, they don't teach any. And I agree. It is the teachers. But if you take a statue and you take a school and you look at them as monuments, and what is the representation of that monument? Whether it's a statue or you make a monument out of a particular school, what's being taught there? Who's teaching it? To be practical, to be analytical, and to be creative. We understand that for me as an African American to read this paper and to put words on paper, we have to understand that in 1886, there was 26 white schools and 17 black schools. We look at, in 1924, the Homer Colored School opened on Roussel Street. We look at, in 1931, the Homer School opened on Church Street, the Little Honduras, which was formerly Southside Elementary. When I was contacted, even today, Southside Elementary, in speaking to a school board personnel, uh, school personnel, they did not know Southdown Elementary existed. If we go back in the beginning, we realized that there was 26 white schools and 17 black schools. Mathematically, Mr. Roster, uh, you taught me um, literature, but Miss St. Martin taught me math. So it's only six schools. So we understand that if Southdown, Southside, was not included in this particular study and some of the other schools were not uh, included in some of these studies, then we ha need to have history classes or we have to do more research. There are a number of circumstances that are here when, if you read this paper, I think everyone has a copy of this, right? We look at Homer Colored School Begins School Instructions. Homer Colored School renames Southdown School. And at the same time in 1949, that the St. Lucie School was actually named also. South Island School opened on St. Charles Street in 1963. And we're looking at Turbon Parish Public Schools integrated and South Island High School was closed. And even though I have divine intervention in this piece of paper, I can put this aside because I can stand before you and speak from my heart. Having very little access and opportunity to make a presentation, I resorted to find some information because I want to be 
uh, sound intelligent, to give information, to be creative. I wanted everyone within the sounds of my voice to be not necessarily uh, to a point really receptive to me, but to take the morals of man and look at education. We speak of how intelligent our kids were. We look back then, there were some circumstances that no one can understand how I felt in 1969 when I received that culture shock. I was in honor classes. I played in the band. We were being prepared by Miss Kidd, Devon Keller, Reverend Danks, Reverend Raleigh, coming from all over the places. We were being prepared to face challenges. And those challenges, when we speak of non public schools, and we say prayers, and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I am American that comes from waterproof, where waterproof plantation estates is. Standing before you in 2022 as a councilman of District 2, I would not change my life and my circumstances for nothing in this world. The position that I'm putting myself in now is to bridge the gap psychologically, how we automatically segregate ourselves within our communities. The understanding has to be that when they segregated the schools, they didn't segregate job applications. They didn't segregate a lot of the other opportunities that they only segregated the schools. But the understanding to people that we have to really realize that schools don't teach. It's the importance of the teachers that teach and the focus that they had. I did a research briefly on how kids were Discipline different. And Mr. Phillips just mentioned, mentioned that they handle kids different. But just as I received a culture shock, I'm pretty sure some of the teachers that I had received their culture shock also. And the reality of life in 2022, we have to really bridge the gap because I really think that when in segregated times that when I pass the torch, to the next speaker, there are some circumstances in 1917 when, because of that challenge to Terrebonne Parish Schools, we created a whole different race of people because we did not allow the association of people as a whole. I'm Christian. I'm Christian is all I do. But I still see in 2022 that sometimes I go places, and this is about education because guess what? You can find an education uh, anywhere. And then it's never too late to learn something. And this is what I'm facing where we can actually go forward because some of the same people that I went to school with, with those same mentalities, they haven't changed. You can be as educated as you want, but morally, we have to be on the same page. Morally, because of that, I do believe in my own mind, because when you look at other countries, when they take their best and they teach their best, they're on a particular level. But I think that we fell behind because of circumstances that we have within ourselves by segregating ourselves by so many different ways. Now, segregation is not really a bad word because we segregate ourselves by, by the food we eat, by the music we listen to, by the church we attend, by the neighborhood that we live in, by the team that we root for. But realistically, I'm here because of my position. Would I be here if it wasn't for my position? 
So I am proud to stand here to educate, to speak of the black experience. I'm a part of the black experience, and I will welcome any questions about the experience. But then what I'm trying to get here is, are you willing to be objective enough to hold the conversation? Are you willing to hear creativity? Are you willing to hear my analytics? Are you willing to hear my perspective? But not only hear, but accept them. We all have an opportunity within the school system, and I think in the last 50 years that we have made so much progress. And I oftentimes, I tell my brother, I say, well, I studied under Miss Rigsby. Music appreciation. I listen to Bach, I listen to Handel, uh, Ragtime, Bluegrass, Country and Western, all of these different cultures. And I understand as we put our football players on the, on the field, and I, me and Mr. Bozo, we had a conversation. Music and love are universal. You have to be able to really realize how we are going into the future because I feel at times that we are recessing because we are losing our children to drugs and other things that are out there and we're just not teaching them any better. To conclude, basically, to create conversation down the line and to realistically look at where we are, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to let you know my story and experience some things that I have. But it's the morals of man, because of my Christian values, I have to approach. I stand here not hating anyone, but I choose to have this parish do more research and not This is history. I welcome the 200th anniversary birthday of Turbon Parish. It is history. But there are many out there like Miss Street, Mr. Freddie Douglas, who's dead and gone, who taught me how to play chess. Mr. Ross gave me extra words to come out of my brain, off my lips. Miss St. Martin, um, I remember sweet as she was in 1973, I think I had a math class with her and she was real, real nice. We've come a very, very long way from the days of my mother when I asked her, she said, well, they really treated black people bad then. And to hear that from my mother, that's why I stand up here to say that. Because you know what else she said? And I'm have, I have a witness in here, and they're still doing it. It's two-way street. But education is very, very important. I know that I got off script a little bit because I felt that way, that I really needed to say that because oftentimes we give programs and as I close, I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to leave this with you on the morals. I am an elected official. I was contacted by my class. I said, we need, I heard you, uh, that you do a lot for the community. I see you on TV. You're doing well. But I need your help to find some black folk that graduated us in 1973, covering that 50 years that you're talking about. I said, yeah, well, I can do that. I said, well, we got the place. We got basically the theme. It's going to cost this much, and it's 
this day. We're planning for this day. Trust me, I'm an elected official. It shouldn't be no problem contacting me. And I said, we have to do a better job because these people that are 67 and around my age, they still running Turbo and Parish. So we have to get out of that mindset that you kind of called me late. And I had to be honest with them. So, well, look, I can do that and I will attend. But I'm pretty sure you could have done a better job than what you did for me being an elected official. And it's a Johnny come lately type thing. That's the reality of it. You want to be objective. You want to be creative. There's so many people within my community who want to get involved with Turbone Parish. Education, politics, businesses, and everything else. In order for this parish to go forward, we have to get out of that. I will attend my class reunion, but I never received a phone call once I spoke the truth that you're going to call me now. And I'm still waiting on that phone call because I want to participate. And oftentimes I walk into places and it seems as if that I'm in a position that I have to represent fairly as a Christian. And I hold no hatred. I'm trying to reach people where we can be a better community. Well, the next 200 years that we have certain things. When this lady come, I did research on, on Gibson School. And there's another section of people that has 14% of people at, the, at Gibson School. They're changing the community. They're interacting much better. We have a better future. It's the older folk that have to get out of that. Make way for the young folk. Give them an opportunity to excel, to be more competitive on an international level, level because we are losing our children. My name is Carl Harding. I'm going to welcome any questions, to be honest with you. I represent Turbon Parish with my heart. I love it. I do all that I could, but sometimes it gets difficult to bridge the gap between two communities and the third community that would be coming forward to us and bring us forward to a true Turbon Parish and a better nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Uh, next, we have Angel Verdan Black, who is a graduate of South Terrebonne High School and Nichols State University. She's a lifelong resident of Terrebonne Parish, and she presently lives in Berg with her husband and two children. Angel is a member of the Ponache Indian Tribe and currently serves at the, as on the Tribal Council. She is a school counselor in Terrebonne Parish uh, in public schools and she works under federal programs, which includes the Indian Education Program. So now I give you Ms. Black. Hi. Um, I'm going to start off with the very first school that provided education to Indians in the parish. Um, it was located at Pono Barre in Montague, Louisiana. Um, it serviced both white and Indian students, and it was open from 1900 until 1910. It was a French-speaking Stoufflet school that offered. And I, I did little maps on all the schools that I'm going to talk to you about. So I just kind of want you to notice the little stars kind of stay concentrated in a certain area, which are your typically higher populated Native American schools. From 1928 to 1948, Baptist, Methodist, and Catholic mission schools began to open in Native American communities. However, they never offered our students any higher than an eighth grade education. Starting in the West, <laughs> Duard, in 1932, the Sue Johnson Memorial Baptist Mission School opened, and then a little later, the Immaculate Conception Catholic Mission. Moving on to Dulac, in 1932, the Dulac Indian Mission School, which was the Methodist Mission School, opened. And records show that in 1938, just six years later, the enrollment at that school was 262 Indian students. 
In the 1940s, the Cath um, Clanton Chapel was a mission school that was actually delivered by barge from Port Sulphur to Dulac. In 1945, the Q to R's Catholic Chapel also offered education to Indian students. In Autogen Charles, unfortunately I don't have a picture, but we do know that there was a school that started operating there in 1948. The missionaries actually came over from an established school in Golden Meadow. They came by boat and they began teaching those students. Right over to a little further to the east in Ponishan. In 1938, a Baptist mission school opened in Ponishan. The very first class um, that was there, it was only a first grade class of 32 students, and their ages ranged from six all the way up to 19 years of age. From 1948 to 1963, Terrebonne Parish School District did open three Indian schools in the parish. The first was in Montague. In 1934, a federal government grant issued Terrebonne Parish School District $920 in funding which the school board designated to build a one-room Indian school in Pornishan. In 1939, Superintendent Bourgeois approved four Indian schools to be built, one in Autogen Charles, one in Lower Montague, one in Lower Grand Caillou, and one in Dularge. It was not until 1942 that the Lower Montague Indian School opened, which was eight years after the original funds were donated. The other three schools were never built. The Daigville Indian School. This was the first, there you go. This was the first public Indian high school and opened in 1959 in Homa. This was four years after the Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision to integrate public schools. The mascot of the school was the Hawks. Next we have LaCarpe Indian High School. This was built in 1963 and is currently home to Acadian Elementary School. Actually, if you go in the lobby of Acadian Elementary and you remove the plaque that's currently there, you will find the LaCarpe Indian High School plaque. In 1964, the Terrebonne Parish Public Elementary Schools began to accept Native American students. Shortly following, in 1967, Terrebonne Parish Public High Schools began to accept Native American students. At this time, I'd like to share a narrative with you from Charles Verdant Sr. I find that it's important because I feel like his experience was probably very similar to other students at that time. I started school in August of 1963 when I was six years old. At that time, I attended the Indian school on the Terrebonne side of Pontichet because we were not allowed to go to public school. I spent my first and second grade years at the Indian school. In 1965, the Indian students were integrated into the public school system. This was the year we were allowed to attend Pontichet Elementary. Several parents of white students surrounded our bus and protested to keep us from getting off the bus. After hours had passed, Constable Reggie Dupre was able to get the parents to allow us get off, to get off the bus using threats. I remained at Pontish Elementary until Montague Middle was built. Integration into the public school system was not an easy transition. There were many obstacles to cross. One obstacle was the language barrier. We were a French-speaking community and none of us spoke English when we entered school. The teachers spoke English and we spoke French. The language barrier was very difficult. Not only did we not speak English, but the teachers didn't allow us to speak French. As we learned English, communication was better. However, school was the only place we spoke English because our parents and grandparents spoke strictly French in our community. Another issue we faced at school was discrimination. Whites were very adamant about saying they were from Upper Pornishan. Upper Pornishan was white, and Lower Pornishan was Indian. Even though the white kids wanted to be friends with us, the majority of them were not allowed to visit us, and we were not allowed to visit their homes because their parents were prejudiced against Indians. Rita Dutu Dion. She was the first Native American to graduate from a previously all-white high school in Terrebonne Parish. She graduated from South Terrebonne High School in 1968. As she received her diploma, she was escorted by the police because of protesters. H.L. Bourgeois High School opened in 1973. Its name honored H.L. Bourgeois, who was um, Terrebonne Parish School District Superintendent from 1914 until 1955. 
Throughout his tenure as superintendent, Native Americans constantly pet petitioned for the education of their children. In Mr. Bourgeois' master's thesis that was released in 1938, he had a chapter called So-Called Indians. He called us pariahs. In his mind, well, actually quoted in his thesis, he states that Native Americans were an imaginary racial zone midway between white and black. It's ironic that a school in his namesake, the mascot is an Indian. I'd like to go over a timeline with you about the Indian education program that still exists in the Terrebonne Parish School District. In 1964, the Terrebonne, no sorry, 74, <laughs> the Terrebonne Parish School District was awarded an Indian education formula grant from the United States Department of Education. Ms. Corrine Polk was hired as the program secretary and her job was to locate, enroll, and keep sufficient records of the Native American students in the district. Ms. Corrine Polk attended the Dulac Indian Methodist Mission School as a young girl. There was no high school in the area that she was allowed to attend, so she was sent to a boarding school in Georgia. She received her high school degree from the Vashti High School in Georgia, a school which accepted both whites and a few Indians. The program also funded three paraprofessionals when it was first accepted into the school district. In addition, there was a dental program my aunt actually told me recently that her very first dental checkup was when she was in high school that was offered through the program. In 1979, the formula grant began to focus on attendance. Mr. Kirby Verrett was hired as the program coordinator, and he was hired to work directly with the school district child welfare and attendance department. His job also included making home visits to students who were at risk. Mr. Kirby Verrett attended Lower Dulard Missionary School, he started first grade when he was eight years old. After that, he attended the Lower Dularge Indian School until eighth grade. Because he served as an altar boy for three years at the St. Eloi Catholic Church in Dularge, the priest there spoke to the St. Francis Boys School, and he was allowed admittance for ninth grade in 1963. He was the only Indian who attended, and on his very first day, they announced in the loudspeaker, Mr. Kirby Verrett is here to get an education. However, he is an Indian, and if he messes up at all, he will be expelled. Um, he will be asked to leave. For 11th grade, Mr. Kirby attended Homa Central Catholic, and 12th grade, he attended Vanderbilt Catholic High School. That year, he was voted most school-spirited. In 12th grade, he was asked to transfer to Terrebonne High School. However, after speaking to some fellow friends who attended, they advised him against it. He said that the teachers there let them know that although they were required by law to allow Indians to attend, they were not required to teach them. I gave you this information on Ms. Corrine and Mr. Kirby because they were pillars in the public school um, Indian education program. They were there from the very beginning. Mr. Kirby is still there, and <laughs> Ms. Corrine stayed until the early 2000s. Found a very interested, interesting that they put so much of their heart and soul into the program, they were never allowed to attend a public school in the parish. In 1998, the Indian Education Program began to offer Native American Month presentations during the month of November. That's also the same year they began offering Native American graduation ceremonies. In 2014, the program held their 40th anniversary celebration. It was held at the Holman Municipal Auditorium very ironic, considering that Native Americans were not allowed in that building at one time. In 2018, another um, federal formula grant was offered to the public school system, it's the Native Youth Community Project, which I'll talk about in just a minute. These are pictures of the Indian Education Program. At this time, the program funds eight paraprofessionals in elementary and middle schools who have the highest number of Native American students. For the past few years, over 100 Native American students have graduated from the public school system, and we still hold the special graduation ceremony for them each year at the Homo Municipal Auditorium. During the month of November, the program continues to offer Native American month presentations. This includes crafters who show students basket weaving, beading, dancing, drumming, and trapping. They offer field trips and also cultural craft nights. 
This is some of the work of the Native Youth Community Project. That grant was offered starting in December 2017 and just recently ended in May of 2022. It offered college and career field trips, behavior intervention programs. It started Native American clubs in a few schools. It offered ACT prep courses, virtual job shadowing, and summer cultural camps. We hope that the parish will reapply in the near future. On June 10th of 2021, Ponishat Elementary School was officially closed. At that time, there were about 100 students enrolled, 70 of which were Native American. At that time, that was the highest percentage of Native American students in any school in the parish. There was much opposition by the Ponishan community. Petitions were signed and a lawsuit suit was even filed. On June 24, 2022, Governor John Bell Edwards signed a bill to approve a French language school in Ponishan. $3 million in funding has already been allocated to the school and they have ambitious plans to open by August of 2023 and they plan to serve grades K through fourth. Thank you to the people who helped me research this. I wanna give them a little shout out, especially Dr. Chris Sinak is actually here. Um, Ms. Corrine Polk, Chairman Charles Verdan, Ms. Kathy Verdan, and Mr. Kirby Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. And last but certainly not least, uh, we, we always say in our culture that there's always a little extra in something. And this is going to be our extra, our lanyap of our program. And uh, it'll be presented by Dr. Christopher Sinak Sr., who is a board certified orthopedic surgeon practicing in Houma, Louisiana since 1976. He is a 1964 graduate of Terrebonne High School and a graduate of LSU. He's also a founding member of Writing Louisiana, a committee of the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities that supports publications by prominent Louisiana writers. And he's authored four books on the history of Terrebonne Parish. They are The Eyes of an Eagle, Jean-Pierre, Livestock Brands and Marks, an Unexpected Bayou Country History, 1822 through 1946, Pioneer Families of Terrebonne Parish, Hard Scrabble to Hallelujah, Volume 1, Bayou Terrebonne Legacies of Terrebonne Parish, and Hard Scramble to Hallelujah, Volume 2, The Bowie Brothers and Bayou Buffalo du Large. And now I give you Dr. Sinag. Okay. I'm going to put it right here for a second. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not a school teacher. Um, <clears throat> I thank everybody for being here. Um, my interest is to try to understand how we got to this stage and what occurred and just trying to document it. Um, uh, I never was, I was a student, incidentally. Um, I'll point out that uh, I was at the Homer Academy, boys' school, and my classroom was the first one on the left on the first floor. And the Sweet Marionites had a stick. And they put your fingers out here like this when you didn't pay attention. And they informed you who was in charge of the class. Jews, you remember that? June? Okay. Um, sorry, I gotta do this. Which one I press, the middle one? Oh, here we go, there you go. This is how it all started. April 6, 1822, the first meeting, the new Terrebonne Parish. English and French, on the left, English, the regulations, and in French on the right, the regular men. It recorded every meeting in English and French up until approximately 1860. 
at that first meeting, they passed the resolution for roads, fences, they created six districts, they appointed five school administrators, and established a temporary courthouse in present day by a cane by the, uh, by the mall of Alexander Dupre's house where they had their meetings and they paid him $10 a meeting. The first school administrators were Francis Gayol, William S. Watkins, Henry Scala Thibodeau, Lefroy Burra, and Henry M. Thibodeau. In 1840, the McMaster School was built. Alex McMaster was hired by the Terrebonne Parish Police Jury to build the first courthouse at the site of the present old courthouse. The McMaster School was built right behind the courthouse, Main Street Courthouse. Behind the courthouse was the jail and across School Street was the McMaster School facing Church Street. 1849, 982 educable children in Terrebonne Parish, 236 were attending school, and they averaged around five months and 15 days a year. Here's our Homer Academy, and that's a very rare picture from the side, shows the whole thing. Um, what's important about the Homer Academy is that it was built by the Presbyterian Church because the major landowners in Terrebonne Parish were all Presbyterian. Okay? It's sort of just the opposite. Incidentally, they just sold the Presbyterian Church uh, it's going to be torn. It's going to be, uh, I don't know what this church is going to do, uh, but that original build, the building for the Presbyterian Church on Barrow Street has been sold. But they built the first school, um, and they, of course, had their problems, Civil War-wise and what have you, and it went on to be the Marionites. But the first Board of Trustees Alfred Delaporte, F.S. Good, Charles Tennant, N.H. Ryder, Ryder Street, Joseph Aycock, Herman Lowenstein, and Oban Berg. Now we progressed. Terrebonne Parish is growing. And what's important about this picture <clears throat> is that you understand in the early 1800s, I always say that if you throw a rock on anything below I-10 from Texas to Mississippi, the rock lands on something that happened. If you throw the rock for six months in Nebraska and Oklahoma, it's not going to hit anything. And the reason is, when North American people came to the, to, I mean, the European people came to North America, they landed on the East Coast, and they could only come downriver. They couldn't come to New Orleans and go upriver because we didn't have any steamboats. We didn't have any mechanized way to travel. So everybody came down river. What's at the end of the river? Mississippi River, by Lafourche and Donaldsonville, by Terrebonne and Thibodeau, and when you get to Homer, you have all the other five tributaries, distributaries. So Venice, Homer is the Venice of North America. So everybody came down and wound up on the bayou communities. Now, everybody knows about sailboats. Well, what was so hard about sailing in Terrebonne Parish? 
We are bayous. Bayous are narrow. The wind's blowing out the north in the winter. It's easy to f sail straight south from Homer to the coast. But after you fill your boat with fish, oysters, or whatever, how you get back? Can't sail up a narrow canal against the wind. That's what's important about this particular photograph, and everybody needs to understand. That's people pulling the boats up the bayou. That's a Cordell path, meaning there was a path created by people and or animals along every bayou, which subsequently be, tells us why all our roads are along the bayou. Because if you owned a plantation, and it was all owned by people, one of the earlier rules or ordinances was you had to keep all the trees cut on the bayou side so that the animals could walk along the bayou to pull the boat back up to Homer. So that makes sense. So all our roads are on the bayou because that's where people had to walk to start with. I thought it was pretty good. Here we come, and we're in the 1880s, and we're starting to develop steam power, which is the first major thing that happened to Terrebonne Parish mechanism, uh, mechanically, I should say. <clears throat> This is the Homer. The Homer is in the Barataria Canal, right across from present-day Chauvin Funeral Home. There was a canal there from Bayou Terrebonne to Bayou Black, built by Robert Ruffin Barra in the 1840s. This is the Terrebonne, which was a steamship, paddle wheel, tied up at a dock in the Mississippi River across from Canal Street. This is 1945. We still got steamboats going up and down. This is the Harry, right across from, well, well right actually across from the uh, sugarcane experiment station right there on 311. Uh, how many people pass on 311 and can see a sail, I mean, a steamboat? You see the Natchez in New Orleans, but, but you don't see this. That's pretty different. By 1886, the state superintendent listed 43 schools in Terrebonne. Mr. Harding noted that. 26 white, 17 black, 1,044 students. But what's important, there were 33 teachers, 13 guys, 20 girls. That's why they got more female teachers than they got male. They've been doing that a long time. That's the way it was when I was a student anyway. Federal government stepped in and they want to improve our waterways. In the early 1900s, 1890s, this is in by Black, the St. Louis Cypress Company. We all know uh, there's a bridge by the, uh, by the mall on Main Street. They're digging the canal from Main Street to 311, what they call Whiskey Point. That is Bayou Cane. That was dug in 1912 to connect the two bayous, okay? This is the Zoe B, downtown home in 1920. Zoe Barrow is the daughter of Robert Ruffin Barrow, Jr. He named the dredge after his daughter. All of this helped clean up the waterways at the turn of the century, which facilitated people going back and forth. This has been referred to, this is the Stoufflet School. This is the first recorded school, Terrebonne Parish, teach 
Native Americans and a local people. But what's interesting there about the Stoufle School, and this is on this is on by Terrebonne and Lower Montague, they only taught in French. Only in French. Which I thought was pretty interesting. You'd have a tough time with that, huh? Teachers. Well, you remember Miss Unipaw? She taught me French. So what we're turning the century. So we know we sailed over here. We walked up and down the bayers. We got animals pulling the boats back home. We developed in the steamboats. And we got our fishing industry is getting ready to convert. The most important economical thing that happened in Terrebonne Parish was the mechaniz mechanization of the fishing fleet. This is in Seabreeze, 1909. Those are sailing oyster luggers. 1913, we're beginning to put motors in boats. There wasn't big motors now. This is a Fairbanks, three horsepower. <clears throat> they had the Stanley with seven horsepower, the Palmer, seven, the Script, 15, Fairbanks, 12, Bridgeport, 15, Lathrop, 16, International, 20. But the engine of choice in 1910 was the Ford Model A four-cylinder, 40 horsepower, and the Model T was 20 horsepower. Now, what happened? There were several gentlemen did something for the fishing industry, seafood industry. Mr. Leonis Laparus put an 18 horsepower Wolverine injury engine in his boat, the Juniors. Mr. Claudio Belanger put an engine in his boat, sailboat, the Truscott, and Mr. Ernest Rhodes put an engine in his boat, the Espoir. Along with that, Tofil Sanag, my grandfather's older brother, became the Ford agent in 1910. Now, it wasn't a car dealership. He just had the right to get the Ford Motors Terrebonne, not for the cars, but to put them in the sailboat to increase fishing experiences and the big transition occurred because now we had motors. The trawl was invented in 1917 in Florida and got here in the mid-20s. So the, you didn't have to do a saying anymore. We could pull a trawl. So that was a big deal. Now, the reason I was asked to be here if you look at this picture, this is Main Street in Homer, 1905, you don't see any cars. Incidentally, that's a dirt street with a wooden banquette. They paved the first street in Terrebonne Parish, 1935, Main Street for a short period. That's the Courthouse Oaks right here. Now, this is the 4th of July parade in 1909. Corner of Barra in Maine, that's AMJC DuPont. That happens to be my grandfather on the white horse. He was the alderman for the first ward, so he got to be the first one. But what's important, do you see the car? See it right here? And you see the buggies and wagons right there. This is 1909. We're starting to have a few cars. 1911, they got all the cars in Terrebonne Parish and put them on the Main Street at 500 block and took their picture. Things are a little different now, huh? Okay. <clears throat> 
not to be outdone, the Presbyterians with the Homo Academy. Well, I'm going to get to this. Let me finish this first. What did I do? I did, hmm? Yeah. Yep, yeah, this is what we want. Okay, yeah. That's the second thing. I'm sorry. The first school buses, this is Andrew Price School. That's a Model T school bus. So we're, we're beginning modern transportation for school children. There's a Model T school bus in Homer, 1939. Now, 1940 is not that long ago, and we were still riding around with a horse or mule full transportation for children in the rural areas. All right. Like I was going to say, the Presbyterians did the Homer Academy, but the Episcopalians, Reverend Gardner Tucker, 1911, Mr. Walker Lovell brought his son, because these the, the original inhabitants of by the large or Protestant, and there's many reasons for that, but Mr. Lovell, because he knew that his ancestors were Episcopal from England, brought his child to Reverend Gardner Tucker, St. Matthews, to uh, uh, baptize him. Got re Reverend Tucker brought his son back down to his house with his daddy, and they formed, in 1911, the Episcopal Mission, St. Andrew's Episcopal Mission in the house. That's Mr. and Mrs. Lovell, Walker Dominic Lovell, and Bertha Adams Lovell. They subsequently built the St. Andrew's Episcopal Mission in 1928, and they had their own boat right here to bring the children from Lower Du Lodge, their own mission boats, up the bayou to the end of the road to go to school, at the mission school. <sighs> Progress. The big thing for Terrebonne Parish, education-wise, way back, was from 1912 to 1917, we had 10 buildings constructed for Terrebonne Parish School Board. Berg, Montague, Shriva, Boudreau Canal, Bayacane, Chacahula, Chauvin, Grand Caya, Gibson, and Bayou Black. The Favreau Livide architectural firm designed every single one of them. And this is, if you notice, they all sort of look alike. This, they, they started all like this, and they had it on. But some of these schools are still here today. But those schools were built, 10 of them, between 1912 and 1917. We saw some of this before. In the 20s, we were, remember we said that earlier, all of those different schools, 30, 40 different schools, but they were all little one-room schools, and they were all associated with the landowners in the area. Uh, Ashland was at the Ashland Plantation. John T. Moore was at Warburton, because he owned Warburton. St. Elwha, and by the large. It's Ellendale at Ellendale, Chacahula, Dulac, Canebrake, Canebrake Plantation on uh, Grand Cot. This is the Red Hall School, which is in Mechanicville, one of the very early first black schools dating back to the 20s. Okay? Now, what's important about the Falgo School? That's where Mr. Billiard tried to send his children in 1913. That initiated. The, the eventual litigation that wasn't resolved until the 60s. That's the school it started in. And that's 
if you take, uh, you go all the way down to Baya Baya Lodge, you cross over at Falgo Canal Marina, and you come back up a little bit, uh, there's a house there, Mr. Wa Mr. Wilson Wazan's house with a white picket fence. That's where the Falgo School was located. And, and that's what started the litigation for Native Americans to go to uh, be accepted into all schools. And this is why I'm supposed to be here. Remember, we got all the schools now, in all the schools, but we still don't have a lot of transportation way down. This is the original St. Andrew's mission boat. This, they were doing this in the 30s, 20s and 30s. Look how small. You really at Lord Du Large, Mr. Floristal Champagne. This was his boat, the small boat. You lived out past the end of the road. They brought you up to the end of the road where you got on the revenue, and you drove the revenue, and here it is parked in front of Du Large Elementary. It's a lot of trouble, but that's what they were doing. A lot of people have seen this picture. There's five school boats right here in by, in by Black, right not far from where you're from, Mr. Harding, out uh, by Waterproof, okay? A bunch of kids, air conditioned, and they got school uniforms. The white, remember, don't, it's summertime. This is the advance, a little further down by a black. And this is sort of important. The people on by the large are, are um, of, I want to say, North American ancestry, but for different reasons. And a lot of people who presently live in the Bayard Lodge area originally came from the Morgan City area. For instance, Mr. Pierre Parr came from France, went to, landed at the port of Morgan City, and never left. And so he settled the area we call now Pierre Parr. That's his name. All right. There were other people living at Deer Island and other islands in the Atchafalaya, which are in Terrebonne Parish, but below Morgan City in Atchafalaya Bay. This boat right here left, that's Morgan City. That's the old bridge in Morgan City. They left Morgan City, went down the Atchafalaya, got the kids on Deer Island, brought them back up to Morgan City, and transported them to the Gibson School. That's in 1950. A lot of people were around in 1950, but y'all didn't know people were living down there. Whoop. There we go. The Myrtle Grove. School boat on Little Kaya. Up and down the bottom. Myrtle Grove is a plantation where the air base is. It was owned by Robert Ruff and Barry Sr. You might like that. That's the St. Lucie School bus. We turned everything over. In 1958, we had, we had 32 boats, Terrebonne Parish, still hauling 1,000 students to school every day. That's not a long time ago, 1958. Okay? We turned it all over. 1960, this is the St. Lucie school bus. That's a terrible parish school bus. Some of the first school buses. So we, we, we got out the boat system. A thousand kids, I actually remember going to Terrebonne High, Homer Junior High, Terrebonne High, and there were 
kids being transported by boat. That's, that's, a lot, that's not that long ago. 32 boats work in 1958. That's it. I'm good. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sinek. That was very, very interesting. Uh, and now we'll have a Q&A. Um, if we have anyone that has a question, I'll bring the mic to you. You tell who your question's for, and they have mics on their tables, right, at work, okay? And uh, they can answer your questions. Anybody? Okay, Mary. Okay. Uh, I remember when I was at the library in the 80s, I wanted to know about the, because uh, I think it's prolific to the history, about the teacher strike. Because so many people, but I don't remember the years, and I don't remember why, because so many people came into the library because parents were scared their kids weren't getting all the education. But I don't remember the years. I think it was 89. I think it was 89. I think that's a, a relevant part of our history. Would you like to address It was the late 80s. Um, it was a 41-day teacher strike. Depending who you ask, the reason why, you'll get a different answer. Uh, I don't think there's any one answer. What the union at the time, by the way, I did not participate in the teacher strike. Uh, but the, at the time, the union was seeking union recognition from the school board, which was the real objective. Uh, I think that's factual. The, the, some of the reasons that were stated at the time, the board had some financial issues and, and they had frozen everyone's salary. In other words, you got the same thing you got the year before, but not anymore. That, that seemed to be the uh, most substantial, the reason why. But it was a, uh, it was a very disruptive and a, uh, not a fond memory by anybody in the school system. Uh, this, there's the scars for that still have not healed in some places, quite honestly. Um, but as I said, the the this the, the, the and Terrebonne Parish still does not recognize teacher unions. Uh, there are only a few districts, two or three in the state that actually do. But uh, yeah, that was a significant event and a disruptive event, and 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 the. Uh, um, I don't know the split of the teachers. I, I, I do remember this, and I'll tell you, this is a, intended to be humorous, so I don't want to offend anyone. I was working in the school system, school administration. My wife was a teacher, and she just bought a brand new car, beautiful car. And th there was some anxiety going to school, going in the building, coming out of the building, you know, that kind of stuff. So she said, I, I just don't know that, that I'm... I want to go to work, but I just don't know that I want to go through all that. And I said, well, well, you don't have to. She said, really? I said, no, no, but you need to go bring the car keys to Terrebonne Ford. <laughs> because if you're not working, we're not going to be able to pay for that car. Just a humorous note. But yes, it was a significant event. You're correct. Anyone else? I have another one, but I don't want to hold it. I have something to, to comment on about that teacher strike. I was I was in high school at the time, but if you guys remember Jay Leno, you know had the uh, the funny headlines, and it just so happened that the teacher strike was going on around Halloween. So I remember the front page of the Courier, and that was right when the Courier first started having color, you know, uh, pages on the front, and there was a photo of like some witches and stuff because it was Halloween. But the the headline was. Like, I think it was some temporary teachers that the school district had brought in. So, so the Terrebonne Parish School District brings in temporary teachers. And then there's this picture of all these witches. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I showed that to my mom, and she's like, oh, you got to send that to Jane Leno. Oh. He never put it on the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we have a debate. Okay, I'm a product of Terrebonne High School, too. I did not go to home at junior high. I swear I went to Terrebonne B. But people tell me I'm wrong. That it was always home with Junior High. No. It was Terrebonne B for a while. 
When did he go to home? Oh, I must be old. When did he go to home of Junior Hall? I, 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 know, the, I know the librarian can find it, 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 it was originally home of Junior High. It was. And then for a very short period of time, it was an experiment that didn't work very well. It became, it became terrible in B. And it, that lasted maybe two or three years. And then it went back to Homer Junior High and Terrebonne High. There was confusion about the... I'm the product of the state of <laughs> your, your memory is correct, though. There was a Terrebonne B. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes,
go ahead and take a look at some of the memorabilia that we have on display. And I just want to remind you, and uh, maybe Judge Fungi would like to say a few words about what's happening next Thursday. Uh, his group is going to be here presenting. Reggie Lapp. That's what all good leaders do. Yeah, ne next week, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, the topic is uh, Governing Terrebonne. Uh, Reggie Dupre Jr. is going to give, uh, uh, I, I think, a presentation on the police jury, uh, the city of Homer, and some of those leaders. Uh, Clint Downer is going to talk about the legislative delegation, uh, and they get uh, Senator uh, Allen, Allen, the only senator from, you know, Terrebonne Parish. And I'm going to give a, a PowerPoint presentation on the judiciary from 1822 uh, to present. Thank you so much. Here. And thanks again. Don't forget your homework.